Um, similar to the last time that I preached, if you tuned in the last time that I preached, uh, we're going to talk about some difficult things. We're going to talk about uh, addiction. If that is something that's sensitive, uh, if that's something that is really personal for you, I just want to encourage you to do what you can to care for yourself. Um, so it's a personal topic for me. Um, I imagine that it's personal for a lot of other folks. Um, if I were to paint an icon of my brother, if he were a saint, if someone had the nerve to canonize my brother, rather than adorning his head with the halo, I would place the halo in the center of his chest. This is where paramedics performed a sternal rub on his chest for two hours in an effort to revive him following his overdose. I would paint him with bright red bare feet, frozen stiff from standing shoeless on the snowy sidewalk outside of Flint Hurley Regional, waiting for my dad to pick him up following his overdose. My brother is not a saint, neither in the literal sense of the word, nor in the figurative, and for the record, neither am I, neither are any of us. But he is brave, he is strong, he is an addict, and he is in recovery. Thanks be to God, Naloxone, and Suboxone, he is alive. My brother Robbie, whose journey to recovery this congregation has so dutifully covered in prayer, he's alive, but he is an ongoing survivor of the opioid epidemic, a widespread abuse of opiate medications and illicit opiate substances. This opiate epidemic ravages my little city of Lapeer, Michigan. I was always conscious of the collective suffering around me in Lapeer, rather implicitly, this unwellness that was systematized in my hometown. I just never thought that it would happen to me, to my people. You see, the problems of addiction in my mind were the problems of the older, the older siblings of the other kids in my hometown, specifically the poor kids, the kids whose parents were barely in or not at all in the picture, the kids who struggled financially. My image of an addict, I think, is indicative of how I thought about my situation. Though my childhood was by no means picture perfect, I thought that my privilege of being middle class, of having parents with stable jobs, of having health care, could shelter me from the unwellness that was plaguing my hometown. And I was wrong. As I walk with my brother to recovery, he is uh, a little over three months clean as of today. Um, I am constantly aware of how difficult the reality of recovery is. Sonia E. Waters, an Episcopal priest and author of the book Pastoral Care for Addiction, talks about recovery from addiction as a slow sort of resurrection of the self. Addictions, she writes, that grow from deep relational wounds are indeed a problem, but they have also been a source of survival. Chronic behavioral conditions like addiction are ways that individuals like my brother articulate that they have been hurt. They communicate histories of relational suffering. My brother's addiction, as he continues his journey to recovery, might not so easily die. I have had to come to realize it has become a part of his ability to survive in a deeply traumatized body. His recovery is precarious. Part of loving someone who struggles with substance abuse is understanding that exact precarity of their recovery. This is a hard thing to beat and our loved ones might relapse. Part of loving someone in recovery is acknowledging again how precarious all of our lives can be, especially when we are deeply, deeply suffering. The shattering of my reality hurt and it hurt like a mother. It was an acute and intense suffering, but it was also a suffering that lasted long before and long after my brother's overdose. It was a suffering that worked in the minutia of my life in the everyday and also in the large world shattering paradigm shifting motions. What I learned from this is that suffering is an ongoing presence in our lives as a matter of fact as the day and as the night. It's not like I hadn't suffered before my brother's overdose, but this moment revealed to me how precariously we are all perched between unwellness and wellness. See, if we're going to talk about wellness, I think we also have to talk about unwellness. 
If we're going to discuss moving forward into a more holistic sense of ourselves, we also have to talk about what it means to be fragmented and distant from ourselves. And I think Job, and again, thank you, Alice, for your beautiful reading. I think Job is a really great place to start. So the story of Job is a move from wellness to unwellness, back to wellness again. Job has it all, loses it all as God and Satan, Hebrew for the adversary, wager on his faithfulness. What we heard out of the story of Job today is the response of the creator out of the midst of this whirlwind, this encroaching storm. Before this, Job had lost everything, his children, his wealth. He was physically afflicted. He kept asking, where are you, God, with no answer? Can you imagine being Job in that minute? Put yourself there if you can. And for some of us, it's not that hard of a task, right? Can you imagine the aching silence where Job longed not only to hear the voice of God, but to fight with the voice of God, uh, to make his case before the divine asking why, why? And in the midst of the howling winds of the storm, God howls right back to Job. That I, I'm so struck by those first two passages that can you, how does God say that? How does God say those first two verses? Uh, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge, gird up your loins like a man. And when he says this, I think he is just reminding Job of how small he is and not in a way that is belittling, but in a way that reminds him of his humanity when he has lost so much sense of it to remind him how delicate and fragile his life is. See, compared to the creator of the universe that ordered the stars and set in place the ground upon which he stands, we are all so, 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 so powerless over our own circumstances, which is why we need an advocate. The other lectionary reading for today is Isaiah 53, starting with verse four. And it says, surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole and by his bruises, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This text as the Jewish people understands it because while it also belongs to us, it also belongs to the Jewish people as they understand it. Uh, this text is about the Messiah and it is so, so, so important to understanding Jesus because Jesus knew this verse. Jesus, his life, his ministry, and his death were informed by this model, this example of the suffering servant that is presented in Isaiah. It is formative to his own understanding of the cross that he would bear. The more I suffered, the more my family suffered, the more I watched my brother suffer, the more my relationship with the cross changed, the more it had to change. I wasn't satisfied with the Jesus I had grown up believing in, more fully God than human and also untouchable. Yes, he was crucified, but he came back and everything was great and everything was fine. No, the reality of the cross is that Jesus gets the human experience of suffering. See, unlike Job, Jesus was abandoned by God. Eloi, Eloi, lama shabachthani. Jesus experienced the worst and most demeaning death that you could die in that time. Jesus' suffering was physical. It was spiritual. It was social. If anyone were to understand what my family was walking through with my brother's addiction, with my brother's affliction, it would be Jesus. If anyone could ever understand what it meant to be so deeply hurt, it would be Jesus who bore these things. When my brother overdosed last November, it was about the same time when I sort of met Julian of Norwich. Um, I deconstructed my evangelical Christianity in the Episcopal Church, so I'm really fond of saints. And this one in particular, and she's got such an interesting and beautiful way of understanding Jesus' death on the cross. Julian of Norwich was an English mystic and author of the first English book known to be written by a woman, Divine Revelations of Love. She lived during the Black Death in a little port city of Norwich, which had just been the location of a peasant's revolt. She lived, as we all do in this moment, in a time of great illness and social upheaval. 
Julian asks uh, God to receive a vision of the crucifixion among other mystical things. And then she writes in her book, Divine Revelations of Love, that the beholding of the sight of Christ's suffering on the cross with all the pains that ever were or ever shall be. And for all this, I understood the passion of Christ to be the greatest pain and overpassing all other pains. It was shewn in a touch and readily passed into comfort. For our good Lord does not want the soul to be frightened by this ugly sight. Julian of Norwich experiences for a second that universal suffering of all people, that all that ever was, all that ever will be on the cross, not out of a want to suffer just for suffering's sake, but she does this out of a want to contextualize the suffering of her own people, to have greater compassion for her own people. See, if we understand Christ's death on the cross as Julian does, is something that, yes, is horrible, but is ultimately comforting to us and redemptive, we begin to see that there is something that can be done with suffering. My brother's addiction changed everything. I remember the suffering we endured as a family in the months before and the months after. And I remembered how it even changed the way that I talked to my family. We started talking about the young people in Lapeer and surrounding areas dying slowly or dying suddenly from the opioid epidemic. We talked about the police involvement in busting drug operations operating pretty blatantly out of businesses in downtown Lapeer. This is how obvious and how prevalent this problem is where I'm from. We talked, about the dec we talked about decriminalization and what's going on in Portugal and argued, at least my father and I argued, about the war on drugs. We exchanged resources about trauma, the neuroscience of addiction, families of addicts, anything and everything to try to make meaning, to try to make sense of our suffering, of our collective unwellness. Watching someone I love develop this substance abuse disorder, what Sonia E. Waters calls a soul sickness, it has taught me something. It gave me compassion. Like I said earlier, my images of those who can and do suffer from addiction and from substance abuse were one thing. Now they are broader, more informed, more sensitive to the complicated nature of addiction. Suffering, it hurt. It hurt, but it gave me perspective. Suffering opened my eyes. This specific suffering showed me that we can endure a lot, and we are going to. We're human beings. Suffering is part of the human existence, and we cannot escape it. But we can make sense of it, and we can try to find something redemptive out of it. If suffering has given me anything, it has given me a shared language with which I can talk to other people who are suffering in this way, talk to other family members of addicts. Uh, the more I am open about my family's journey of walking with my brother through the hardest parts of his soul sickness, the more I find that other people can relate. I was on the train uh, heading back from Lapeer after spending a week with my father. Um, and I just sort of started talking as I do because I'm nice and from the Midwest with the woman who was sitting next to me on the train. And the more that we talked, the more that we shared, I opened up and I said, my brother is struggling with substance abuse. And she burst into tears and said, my son is dealing with the same exact things. They could have been the same person. The shared experience of suffering, through the shared experience of suffering, we were able to find solidarity in our struggle and that's so important. Suffering and being open about our suffering can give us a community of people who are also going through it and alongside of us. If we are vocal about our hurt, we might often find that we are not alone in it. If suffering has given me anything, suffering has given me the ability to look strangers in the eye and see the full glory of their humanity in the face of adversity. It has given me the family to say, it has given me the ability to say to families of other of addicts that you are not alone. There are people who understand what you're going through in the big ways that it hurts and in the little ways that it hurts too. And it's given me the ability to say to people struggling with substance abuse that you too are not alone. And you are so, so, so beloved, all of you. And you are worthy of help and attention and care. If suffering has given me anything, this is, this is the bit, this is the bit that I think is important. It's given me resilience. 
It hurt, and I'm not going to downplay how much it hurt, but I can bear that hurt a little bit easier now. And I understand Julian of Norwich, the more that I suffer and the more that I sort of come to grips and try not to avoid my suffering, uh, the more I understand her when she says in her famous quote, all shall be well and all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. I say this as a mantra when I feel overwhelmed by the precarity of my own situation. She's not saying everything is going to be all right. And at the end of our suffering, God will right all the wrongs like at the end of Job. That's not always a given. She's saying that despite it all, all shall in the end be well with our soul. As the hymn says, we suffer, we don't suffer alone. We suffer alongside an advocate who knows our pain deeply and intimately, who bore it himself on the cross. Do you ever take that to Jesus in prayer when you're going through something? It changes something. It changed something for me to be able to identify acutely that my suffering is also what Jesus bore, to know that Jesus 100% gets it. If suffering has given me anything, it's given me this resilience. Um, it's given me this ability to say, all shall be well, all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Julian of Norwich is saying that we suffer and that we suffer alongside um, each other. We suffer alongside of people who, if we are sensitive enough to ask, have borne this pain themselves. I don't have a neat answer for why we suffer. Um, if you notice during that sermon, I did, during the sermon, I did not solve the problem of evil. Um, all I know is that what we can make of suffering, and if we are mindful of our spirits and of our perspectives, suffering can beget something beautiful. Compassion for the other, compassion for ourselves, cultivating wellness by understanding fully what it means to be unwell. This doesn't mean that it hurts any less because it won't. All we have is hope that our suffering means something to us and to God and bringing heaven through our suffering, through the compassion that is cultivated in it, through the understanding that is cultivated in it, and through our solidarity. The song says we can bring a little city called heaven a little closer to earth. Amen.